Hey, I am the forgetful pastor, and I, we have some ushers at the back, and I'm going to ask them to come. We are going to receive a dollar blessing today for the food pantry. Uh, we want to support the food pantry, and there's, of course, you can bring food and do that, but we're just going to receive an offering today, just a dollar offering. So if you've got a dollar, a five, a ten that you want to do, uh, give to uh, help support the food pantry, uh, just pass that down the row, and the ushers will be there to, to pick that up. We're, I think we're just going to pass the money down the row and then put them in the bags. And uh, anyway, thank you for... for, for um, supporting them. And if you have food that you want to bring, there are some tables here. You can bring that over the next week or so, definitely. Uh, but we want to help those in our community that are in need. And so thank you for, for blessing them that way. This is, uh, this is uh, the red bearded guy, um, Esau. Is that, is that what we called you way back when? Yeah, we, yes. we had no idea that he uh, was in the likeness of, of, of Esau. Yeah. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, forget that I even said anything. But this is August. <laughs> he's, he's one of our youth pastors. Give him a warm welcome. He's bringing the word Thank today. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Awesome. Man, it's a good day to be in church. You guys excited to be in church today? Come on, that was lame. Are you excited to be in church today? Uh, it's a warm day to be in church. It's even warmer in the cage. Praise Jesus. But I'm ready to go. Man, I am so excited to be here this morning. We're doing a new series called Easter Peeps. As you can tell by the graphic up there on the screen, uh, our beloved uh, executive team decided to choose the worst Easter candy on the planet and go with that this year. It really should have been Easter nerds jelly beans, but it's fine. Uh, we'll go with this, or Starburst jelly beans, uh, those, are, those are great, or uh, the pound chocolate bunny, right? One pound of chocolate, come on, come on, I don't know if you can find that anymore, but I got rotten teeth from it when I was a kid, yeah, but hey, we say something every, every week in, in youth to our students, and I want to say it uh, this morning because I believe it's important, and this is what we say, we believe that Jesus is here. We believe that Jesus cares about you, and we believe that Jesus has something that he wants to say to you today. It's important to be in church. It's important that you're here this morning, and it's important to pay attention. Come on. <laughs> Come on. So this is what we tell our teenagers. We're asking you, I'm challenging you, we're asking you to not be a distraction and to not be distracted. So husbands, what does that mean for you? That means that this is the one and only time in your life you get to look at your wife and say, stop talking. <laughs> and wives, this is your time to smack them when they fall asleep. <laughs> Come on, this is it. Don't be a distraction and don't be uh, distracted because we believe that God has something that he wants to say to every person in this place today. And at the end of my time this morning, uh, I believe that Jesus is going to move. I believe that the Holy Spirit's going to move. And we're going to open up these altars. We're going to have uh, pastors and prayer team members and elders and deacons available to pray with you. And we're going to have a moment where you get to respond to Jesus. And I'm going to challenge you to step out of your comfort zone, to meet Jesus here, because I believe that he uh, is going to do something in your life this morning. Is anybody with me at church today? Come on, let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for how you love us. And God, we ask that as we focus on your word today, as we focus on uh, your story, Lord, that our story would be changed and our lives would be impacted. And God, we ask for you to speak to us today. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. It's in your name. Everybody said... Amen. So, new series, Easter Peeps. Over the next few weeks leading us into Easter, we're going to highlight some of the characters out of the Easter story, some of the people that we encounter who are a part of the Easter story. And this morning, we're going to take a look at a guy named Thomas. Thomas, right? Thomas only appears a few times in scripture, but two of the records that we have about Thomas, they come with some of the most profound statements made in scripture, statements that our faith is built on. So you can turn your Bibles to John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. Yeah. 
We're going to get there in a moment. That's going to be the main story that we sit on uh, for our time today. We're going to go through a couple other scriptures before that, which will be on the screens. But John 20, 24 through 29 is where we're going to sit today. So uh, when we're introduced to Thomas in the books of uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are known as the Synoptic Gospels, we're introduced to Thomas. And the Bible tells us very little about him. It tells us that he's the twin. This is Thomas, also known as Didymus, which means the twin. But the Bible never identifies who his twin is. Keep that in mind as we go through his story uh, story today. But the next time we meet Thomas is in John chapter 11. And John chapter 11 is a big big story. It's a big scripture uh, in the Bible because that's the chapter where Lazarus dies and Jesus goes back and raises Lazarus from the dead, right? Right? And, and so in John chapter 11, Jesus is having this conversation with his disciples because his disciples are saying, hey, we can't go back to where Lazarus is. We can't go back to, to Judea because there's people there that want to stone you. There's people there that want to kill you. And this is where we're going to pick up the story, John chapter 11, verse 11. Then Jesus said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping. But Jesus meant Lazarus had died. Verse 14, so he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there, for now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Verse 16, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go to so that we may die with Jesus. Let's go to and die with Jesus. Some of you have been in church for a long time and you're like, wait a minute. I thought Thomas was the doubter. Wait a minute. I thought Thomas didn't have big faith. But at this moment, Thomas's faith in Jesus is undoubtedly strong. In this moment, his closeness and his relationship with Jesus at this point is so strong that unlike the rest of the disciples in the story telling, uh, in the story telling Jesus that it's a bad idea to go to Judea because they're scared of what might happen, Thomas is loyal to Jesus. And Thomas says, I will follow you wherever you go, even if it means I'm going to die with you in Judea. The first thing that we can learn from Thomas is this. A close relationship to Jesus builds strong faith and loyalty. A close relationship with Jesus brings strong faith and loyalty. When we walk in close proximity, excuse me, wow, that's a word. When we walk in close proximity to Jesus, our faith is strong and we're willing to follow him anywhere, even unto death. Even unto death. Close proximity to Jesus, a close relationship to Jesus, it builds strong faith and loyalty in our lives. And if you're here this morning and you would say, Pastor August, I don't think I have strong faith, my question to you is how close are you to Jesus? Have you strayed far away? Have you met him in a moment, but then missed him for their lifetime? If you don't have strong faith this morning, I believe that Jesus is here and he wants to have an encounter with you to strengthen your faith, to rebuild your faith. Because a close relationship, which is Jesus wants to draw us into his heart. He wants to draw us into himself. He wants to bring us close to him so that our faith can be built and be strong and we will have strong faith and loyalty like Thomas does. The thing I've loved learning about Thomas and his story in scripture is that Thomas is just like any other human. And his life develops and his faith develops in seasons. And oftentimes it looks a little bit like a roller coaster. Thomas goes through really good highs like here. And Thomas goes through really low lows like we're going to read in just a few moments. His response to the different season that he goes through in just these four moments, that are, excuse me, these short moments that we have uh, with him in scripture are extremely important for us because I believe that a lot of us, if we were being honest, we would have very similar responses. When we first start following Jesus, we have an encounter with him at an altar moment or something. We, we're feeling great. Man, this is awesome. This is new. I'm going to follow Jesus anywhere, even if it means I'm going to give up his life. 
We have these similar moments. We have these similar responses. And this is further proven by the next time that we see Thomas, which is in John chapter 14. This is during the Last Supper. And Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. And, and this conversation lasts four chapters, John 13 through 17. And it's all about the end of his life on earth and what's going to come next. And in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7, Jesus says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And when everything is ready, I will come and I will get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. Verse five, no we don't, Lord. Come on, who else is like Thomas? Hold on, wait a minute. I don't know the way. No, we don't, Lord. We have no idea where you're going. How can we know the way? And this is where we get our first profound life-building, faith-building statement from Jesus and his encounter with Thomas. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. And so from now on, you know him and you've seen him. Come on, Thomas. Come on, Thomas. Scholars believe that this is the same attitude that Thomas had in, in John chapter 11. Wait a minute, Jesus. Hold on. I don't know where you're going or how to get there, but I want to follow you there. I want to go to where you're going. I want to be where you are. So I don't know where you're going. I am clueless as to what you're saying. So tell me where to go. Tell me how to get there. Because a close relationship to Jesus builds strong faith and loyalty. And here, this is where we get a foundational statement. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Because Thomas was normal like us. And he was willing to say what everybody else was thinking. Jesus, these ambiguous statements, I don't understand. Thomas not only has the ambition and the will to follow Jesus, but he has no problem saying what everybody's thinking. And he's a lot more like us than we want to admit, and it's because we've called him Doubting Thomas. But I don't know about you. For me, I would have responded exactly the same way. Hold on, Jesus. I don't understand. You keep saying that we know where you're going, but we have no idea. And I need to know how to get there. Give me the address. I'll plug it into Google Maps, and you better believe it'll get me there. <laughs> Come on. All of this ambiguous talk, is, it's not clearing anything up for me. And Jesus meets Thomas right there. Jesus meets Thomas right there in the middle of his question. In the middle of his unclearness. In the middle of a moment where he's like, hold on, I, I don't understand. I don't get it. I don't know what's happening. Jesus meets him right there and he says, I'm going to my father's house. And because you have a relationship with me, you already know the way. Because there's only one way to the father and that's through me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Because you know me, you know my father. And because you follow me, you will get to my father's house. Come on, somebody. Come on, because you know me, you will get to my Father's house. Sometimes we need to take our questions straight to Jesus. Lord, this doesn't make sense to me. I'm trying to follow where you're leading, but I need some clarity. And though there are times that he doesn't give us the full picture or all of the details, he will always meet us in the middle of our questions so that he can build our faith. I think too often and a lot of times and for far too long, we've talked about the story of Abraham, right? Father Abraham had many sons. What did God say to Abraham? He said, get up and go to a new place. And what did Abraham do? He got up and went. And too far too long, we've decided and talked about how that is just blind faith and obedience to God. But I don't agree. I don't think that Abraham had blind faith and obedience. I think Abraham had trusting faith and trusting obedience. I think because Abraham knew God, he said, I will trust you even though I don't know where you're taking me. I will follow you because I trust you. More than anything, in Abraham's story and now in Thomas' story, it isn't blind faith or blind obedience. It's trusting faith and trusting obedience. Because I know you, I trust you. 
Because I trust you, I will follow you. And as I'm obedient and following, I will bring my questions, my fears, and my doubts to you because I trust you and I know that you're faithful and I can trust that you're good and I can trust that you won't fail me. And that's the second thing we learned from Thomas' story. A close relationship with Jesus builds trust. A close relationship with Jesus builds trust. So we know that it builds strong faith and loyalty but now we know it also builds trust. Because if you don't trust somebody, how do you expect them to answer your questions? How do you know that you can trust them with your doubt? How do you know that you can trust them with your failures? How do you know that you can trust them? We have to have a close relationship with Jesus because a close relationship with Jesus builds trust. Because I know who he is. Because I know who he's been. I can trust who he's going to be. And I can trust what he's asking me to do. Because if God initiates it, God will sustain it. And that leads us to Thomas's defining moment. Where we're going to sit for the remainder of our time this morning. And this is the story where Thomas gets his beautiful nickname that lasts all the ages. Doubting Thomas. Man, what a terrible name. Oh, I'd hate to be identified by that. After the resurrection of Jesus, right, that we celebrate on Easter, after the resurrection of Jesus, we have these beautiful moments with Mary Magdalene at the tomb where Jesus appears to her and she sees him and she doesn't recognize him at first, but then he says her name and she says, oh, it's Jesus, you're alive. And then she runs back and tells the disciples and then the disciples are like, what's going on? And all of a sudden Jesus is there, peace be with you, right? Come on, spawned out of nowhere, right? Jesus is there in the middle of it all. He's there in the room and he appears to them. But then the Bible tells us this in John chapter 20, starting in verse 24. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Verse 26, eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he looks at Thomas and he says, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer, believe. And look at how Thomas responds. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me and blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Now, real quick, everybody just close your eyes with me for a moment this morning. This is not your time to fall asleep. Just close your eyes, okay? Practice self-control and discipline in this moment. I want you to imagine something with me. Before we just slap this label on Thomas, I want you to imagine your best friend. Who is your best friend to you? Bring that person into the picture of your mind, your best friend. Someone that you've given your life to. Maybe it is a spouse, maybe it's a friend that you've had your entire life, maybe it's, it's a cousin, it's an aunt, it's an uncle, it's a mom, it's a dad. Who's, who's that best friend? Someone you've given your life to, you've walked in close proximity with them for years. You have that person in your mind? Now I want you to imagine that that person is just brutally murdered. You didn't just hear about it, you witnessed it. Not only did you watch your best friend be brutally murdered, but because of your own fear and insecurities, instead of stepping in and trying to stop it or stepping in and dying with them, you abandoned them. And now from a distance, you witness your very best friend brutally beaten to within an inch of their life, stabbed in the head by a crown of thorns, forced to carry a log on their back, a back that is now covered with blood and deep open wounds from the beating that they just endured. And you watch as their murderers are driving nails into their hands, hoisting them high into the air for everyone to see and then to just make sure that their life is gone. You watch as they stab your best friend in their side. 
You watch all of this happen with your own two eyes. You can open your eyes. And then a few days later, people start telling you, even though you just witnessed what you did, that person is alive again. You tell me, how would you respond? Me? My response? <laughs> I know what I saw. And unless I see the proof for myself, I can't believe what you're telling me is true. To convince myself that though my eyes watched him die, he's alive again, without divine intervention, it would be absolutely impossible for me. And this is why I think it's fitting that the Bible doesn't identify Thomas's twin, because if I am being honest, I am his identical twin with an identical response in that moment. And I think if you were being honest, you would be too. And this is the third thing that we learned from Thomas. Our external circumstances will blind us and kill our faith if we allow them to. Our external circumstances, the things that we go through in this life, they will blind us and kill our faith if we allow them to. The New International Version says it like this in John chapter 20, verse 25. Thomas said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Let me offer you this. Thomas wasn't just a doubter. Thomas was an unbeliever. Thomas wasn't just a doubter. Thomas just didn't, didn't just have doubts in the resurrection. He would not believe. Almost hostile. I'll give him grace. But he was almost hostile. Unless I see it for myself, I will not believe. And remember, this is the same guy, the same guy who stood there and watched Jesus call Lazarus out of a grave. This is the same guy who watched Jesus breathe new life into Lazarus. This is the same guy who walked with Jesus, who saw every miracle he ever did, feeding the 5,000, raising the, uh, the little girl who miles away back to life, the lady touching the hem of his garment and immediately being healed from a blood, uh, a blood condition that she had suffered with for 12 years. This is the same guy who witnessed it all, but his current situation was so painful and so dark and it hurt him so badly that he couldn't remember what happened to Lazarus. He couldn't remember what his God had done. His best friend and his mentor was just brutally murdered before his eyes. The very person he gave his life to was now gone. This was the dark night of the soul for Thomas. And some of you are in a tough spot right now. Some of you are in this room going through a dark night of the soul. You've received a cancer diagnosis. You've experienced the death of a loved one. A friend has turned their back on you. You're going through financial struggle. You're in the middle of sinful depravity. Some of you are currently having a dark night of the soul. And because of your current external circumstances, you've forgotten who God has been and what he has done in your past. But the fourth and the last thing that we can learn from Thomas is this. When we bring our doubts, our fears, and our unbelief to Jesus, he will meet us right there. They're in the middle of it. Come on, church. When we bring our doubts, our fears, and our unbelief to Jesus, he meets us right there in the middle of it. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. If we would bring it to Jesus, he will meet us there. Thomas was honest and he was vulnerable with what he was going through and Jesus met him right there in the middle of it. And just like he did for Thomas, I believe that he is showing up right here, right now in front of you saying, look at me, focus your attention on me, see me, encounter me, I'm here, touch my hands, put your hand in my side, know that I am who I am and I am here with you. Jesus is in front of you saying, I will call dead bones back to life. And I will walk you through what you're going through. And I will change your perspective in the middle of your circumstance. Jesus is here. 
Jesus wants to meet with you. Jesus is showing up in the middle of your undoubt, excuse me, in the middle of your doubt and your unbelief. But I think that it's important to recognize how Thomas got to Jesus. Do you realize how Thomas got to Jesus? Right, because Thomas says, if I, don't, if I don't see the nail marks, if I don't put my hands in the nail marks, if I don't put my hands in the side of Jesus, I'll never believe. How did Thomas get there? Because Jesus wasn't there. It was in fellowship with other believers. Excuse me, he was an unbeliever at that time. Fellowship with the believers. Fellowship with his church family. That he is honest and vulnerable about his doubt and his unbelief. And he gives them a glimpse into what he's going through. But here's one thing, another thing that I think we can learn from Thomas is that he doesn't get embarrassed for sharing the truth about where his heart's at. He doesn't get embarrassed about being honest about what he's going through. And the believers around him, they don't scorn him. They don't push him away because of what he's struggling with. And we know that because they're all still together eight days later. They're all still together eight days later. And Jesus, being all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving, shows up eight days later. And I can imagine that for those eight days, they kept praying for Thomas to see Jesus. I can imagine that they're around him saying, no, I know he's real. I know he's alive. I've seen him. And I'm believing that you're going to see him too, Thomas. I'm believing that you're going to witness him just like I did. Me, talking to you from this platform is insignificant compared to the saints of God, the believers around you that are full of the Holy Spirit and the prayers that they can pray over you and the way that they can come alongside you and walk with you until you see Jesus just like Thomas did. It takes you being honest and vulnerable with what you're going through, but it also takes you being trustworthy with the information that is being shared with you. That's for the believers in the room. I doubt the brothers and sisters around Thomas gossiped, gossiped about his unbelief. I think they recognized what he was going through because they had gone through something similar. They didn't label him Doubting Thomas. No, instead church history tells us that those same believers welcomed him into the family and then sent him out as a missionary. They didn't label him Doubting Thomas. They didn't label him by his faults. That was us, the church, ages down the road, who allowed his faults to identify him, who allowed his fault to become his identity. But the people around him, I believe they were trusted to walk and pray with Thomas for as long as it took for him to see Jesus. And quick side note, I think for some of us, if we were being honest, it maybe isn't our life and our circumstances that are causing doubt and unbelief, but it's the state of the world that we live in. We are surrounded by so much evil and darkness that it's becoming harder and harder and harder to see Jesus. And let me tell you something this morning, that's the reason why we cannot stop meeting together. That's the reason why we cannot forsake the gathering of the saints, the gathering of the believers, meeting together as a church family, reminding ourselves, reminding each other that Jesus is coming back, building each other's faith, allowing the testimonies of our brothers and sisters to build our faith and draw us closer to Jesus and reminding ourselves that because Jesus is coming back, we have to stay close to him. Jesus tells us that where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is also. And I believe that we saw that in real life within this story of Thomas. They were gathered together in one accord and Jesus met all of them right there. But then he personally addresses Thomas's unbelief. Touch my hands, put your hand in my side, see me and know that I am alive. I believe that Jesus wants to meet with some of you that are here this morning that have questions and doubts and maybe even some unbelief. I believe that he wants to meet you in the middle of your vulnerability. 
And when Jesus meets Thomas in this moment, we get the first time post-resurrection that the deity of Jesus is confirmed. Thomas says, my Lord and my God, because he recognizes and knows Jesus is more than just a teacher. He's more than just a good moral person. He is the supernatural God of all creation who died, was buried, raised back to life. And he doesn't rebuke Thomas for his doubt or his unbelief. No, he affirms his newfound faith in that moment. And then adds a blessing for the rest of us who would choose to put our faith in Jesus without physically having to see him. Would you stand with me all over this room? I'm coming to a close. As you stand, would you close your eyes? If you're here today and you need to meet Jesus for the very first time, this is your moment. If you're here today and you need to have an encounter with Jesus that changes everything for you, this is your moment and I would like to pray for you. So with eyes closed and heads bowed all across the room, if you're here and you would say, I don't know who Jesus is. I've never met Jesus before. Then in this moment, I wanna tell you something. He's here. He loves you, he cares about you, and he wants to make a difference in your life. So if that's you right now, would you just raise your hand all across this room? If you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, no one's looking around, I see your hand. I see your hand, no one's looking around. I see your hands, I see your hands. God, as I begin to pray over you, would you just begin to have your own conversation with Jesus saying, Jesus, I see you. Jesus, I believe in you, but God, I need to know that you're here. I give up my own way of living and I follow you into the future that you created me for. Would you begin to have that conversation as I pray over you? God, I pray over these individuals that raise their hands today. Lord, I pray that you would give them a, a moment, a Thomas-like moment where they meet with you right here and right now and they experience you and it changes everything for them, God, and that you would become so real to them that they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are who you said you are, that you are the alive God who moves and who does miracles and who wants to walk us into the life that you created us to live. God, I pray for these individuals with raised hands. I pray that you would meet them right here. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Second way I want to respond this morning, and I challenge you to respond, and I'm going to open these altars, is that what we do with our doubts, what we do with our questions, and what we do with our unbelief matters. And what we do will determine how Jesus responds to us. If we bring it to him, he will meet us there and we will find him. But if we make our doubt the truth of our life, and we never seek Jesus to reconcile it? Man, I've had the same question for 40 years and I've never really prayed about it. If that's you, man, you're gonna miss out on Jesus. So if you're here this morning, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to, have, to allow Jesus to reconcile your doubt, to allow Jesus to reconcile the questions that you have to allow Jesus to reconcile your unbelief. And I challenge you to bring them to the altar and let Jesus meet you right here in the middle of it. And so right now, here's what I wanna do. If you're a pastor, if you're a prayer team member, if you're an elder, if you're a deacon or have been in the past, what I want you to do right now is come to the sides of this altar over here. Come now, you can move now and come stand over here. Let's try to make sure we've got enough people on both sides. Because here's what I want, church, and I'm challenging you to step out of your comfort zone. I'm challenging you to step out uh, of your pew and to be honest and vulnerable with where you're at. And I want you to know that we are a church family who loves you and cares about you and believes the best for you and believes that Jesus wants to meet with you right here and right now. And so if you have questions, if you have doubts, if you have some unbelief, if you need to meet Jesus here, then right here, this middle area where nobody's standing, 
this is your spot to meet Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. But these pastors and prayer team members and elders and deacons, these are trusted, safe individuals for you to be honest with what you're going through without shame, without scorn. They'll pray for you and believe with you that Jesus will show himself to you. And also, because we believe in Jesus and we believe that he does miracles, if you have a need in your life, they'll pray with you about it. If you have something that you need Jesus to meet in this moment, they'll pray with you for it. They'll believe with you for it. So please come as I pray. Would you take a step in vulnerability today and watch Jesus meet you? And this wasn't in my notes, but I'm feeling it this morning. If you have a, a loved one, a friend, a family member, somebody in your life that you care about that does not know Jesus, would you be willing to stand in the gap for them? Would you be willing to step, step out of your seat and come and pray and believe because where two or three are gathered there, Jesus is as well. Believe that God can begin to do a divine work in their life. So as I pray, would you respond to Jesus this morning? God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. God, I pray and I ask and I believe that we would be honest with where we're at, that we would be vulnerable with what we're going through, that God, we would tell the truth this morning and shame the devil, and we would allow you to meet us in the middle of our needs, to meet us in the middle of what we're going through. God, I pray that you would move on our hearts and as we respond to you, we would have a Thomas-like moment in the place this morning where we meet you right here in the middle of our, of our doubt, in the middle of our unbelief, in the middle of our need. And you say, I'm here, I'm with you, I'm walking you through. So God, please meet us today. In Jesus' name we pray. If that's you, begin to respond right now in this moment.